Good morning, church. Let's stand and worship the Lord together. Trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust. And how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how Good morning. You can be seated for just a moment if you would like. I just have a few announcements. Number one, I wanted to remind you that No Sweat Evangelism is coming up on August 22nd. So Steve Foster from the Georgia Baptist Mission Board will be here with us in worship that morning. And then we want to invite you to be back that Sunday evening for some evangelism training with him as well. And then I wanted to also tell you that Wednesday night, Mills are back starting this week. And I know my family is super excited about that. I hope you are as well. Um, we have Chick-fil-A this week. So my daughter asked me if we were going to have Polynesian sauce from Chick-fil-A this week. I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that you need to sign up online. So if you're interested in, in doing that, go to the Sunrise website and register online. The prices are $6 for adults, $3 for children, um, 10 and under, and then $20 maximum, which is good for me because I have a family of five. So we're, we're excited about Wednesday nights starting back. And make sure you register on the Monday before the Wednesday. So make sure that you get online and get that done by tomorrow. Truckloading for the Georgia Baptist Children's Home is happening this, this coming week. So if you forgot to bring your items, please drop those at the church office tomorrow between 830 and noon and they are doing the uh, truck loading tomorrow correct tomorrow morning is that right I don't know, sometime, yeah, but we go ahead and bring those uh, items in, and uh, and we definitely appreciate you giving to that ministry. So if you are a first-time guest here at Sunrise, we are so excited that you are here with us this morning, and we hope that you have found your church home, and we want to tell you that in the pew in front of you, you'll find a Connect card that looks like this. We invite you to go ahead and fill that out, just so that we can have some information to send you some information about the exciting things that God is doing here at Sunrise Baptist. And so I'm so excited to continue to worship this morning. So Thank congregation, you. if you would stand with us and we'll continue to worship.
Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unveiling love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life.
let's reaffirm this to him. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. All God's people said, Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me, if you will, is this on? It's got new batteries in it. Bring it up. There we go. There we go. The people at home probably think, does he ever get his microphone on right? So it, it, those of you at home, it's on me. It's not on the, the sound folks. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to John's Gospel, the 15th chapter. We're continuing in our series on abiding in Christ. Now before we get to the message, some of you probably hate to hear, or hear me say that before we get to the message. It's like, well, what's going to happen now? Let me start it this way. Judy likes to go antiquing, you know, those antique places. And so we'll be driving down the road sometimes, places, and she'll see a, an antique place. Well, I'm the guy that I've got a destination in mind, right? And so the statement always is, there's an antique place, not that you're stopping. And I just keep on going. Now we've got, amen, thank you. We've got some friends that that husband, he always pulls over. He'll make a U-turn and go back in a heartbeat, not me. I'm on my way somewhere and I've got a destination in mind and I'm going to get there. Usually early because I don't like to be late to anything. Now, y'all got a bunch of amens there. Let's see if I get amens with this next part. As I was driving in this morning, here's what God told me. God told me to call you to prayer this morning. It's not because I don't have a bunch of message to preach, because I've got a bunch of that. But I don't want God saying to me, not that you're stopping. Here's what God said. Several of you have confirmed this to me this morning in conversations. You didn't know it, but you were. If there's something, let me just do it this way. Would everybody just stand where you are? Now, you don't have to come down here. But if you've got something going on in your life physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, relationally, that you want to ask God to do a work in that situation, I want to invite you to come and just stand here across the front. Just leave where you are and come stand right here. God was very plain when he spoke to me this morning. And I said, well, Lord, that, that, that's going to take away from the message. He said, I don't care. Are you going to obey me? So we're going to obey him. Now you understand, I am just a man. I am just a human being, just like you are. We, be, we, we all say in church, we believe in prayer. But do we really? Well, I want us to trust God in prayer right now. And I want to intercede in your behalf, each and every one of you today. Because I am confident that God is here today. And I am confident that he will hear our prayers. 
So let's pray together. Father, for these that are gathered here this morning, you know their need. You know whether it's a physical need, a health concern. There are some here today, just in recent days, have gotten a diagnosis. And they don't even know what the future holds for them, but you do. You have not left them alone. I pray, Father, that you will confirm in their hearts today that you are very near them. That you are the great physician. That, Father, nothing, nothing is too difficult for you. Father, for those who are struggling spiritually, they can't seem to get on top of this thing called the Christian life. Would you remind them, Father, that that they have been infused with the presence and life of Jesus Christ. And it is not their responsibility to get it all right, but it is your responsibility to live your life in and through them if they will just quit trying and trust you. Lord, for those who are struggling financially, Lord, you own it all. And Lord, you're able to bring blessings and finances and and restoration and freedom out of nowhere, seemingly. And so, Father, we ask you today that you would encourage them, that you would help them. You would provide the resources they need. Lord, there are some standing here today that are struggling emotionally, they're anxious. They're nervous. Some are depressed. Oh, they smile on the outside, but on the inside, there's a great battle going on. We speak in the name of Jesus against depression, against anxiety, against pain, against sorrow. And we ask you to set them free from these things. Lord, there are some that are struggling with relationships. Some, I'm very aware right now, even the relationship with their own children. They love their children. They're they're praying for their children. They want to see their children back in church. They want to see their children set free from the things that this world has brought bondage to them. And Father, today, we ask you to hear their prayers. To To continue, I won't say begin, Father, but to continue working in the way that you have been. Lord, would you grant them, if it's your will, just open their eyes slightly that they might see what you are doing in the lives of their children and their family and their friends. Lord, we we are trusting you today. Lord, we're very aware that it is not through the flurry of words, but it's through the power of God that prayers are heard and that prayers are answered. And so, Father, today, we come before you with these these requests. Lord, would you put your arms around these folks? Would you love on them? Would you encourage them? Father, I'm reminded right now that though there are several that are going to be having surgery or procedures this next week. We pray in advance that you would guide the hand of that surgeon. You would guide those technicians. The Father, as much as the, as the world of medical science knows, it pales compared to what you know about these bodies we live in. And so, Father, I pray for healing. I pray for wholeness. I pray for the corrective surgery, the testing that's to be done. We love you, Father. In Jesus' living name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated, please? Back to your seats. When you get there, if you just stand for the word, those of some of you are seated and that's proper, that's fine, that's not a problem. Um, we're going to look in John's Gospel, the 15th chapter. And here's what our text says. Jesus speaking here, you remember that Jesus is on his way to Gethsemane with the disciples. 
He's just left the upper room. Um, he knows that he is in the process of being betrayed. And in that setting, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser or vineyard owner. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do Nothing. If anything, if, excuse me, if anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will or what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So will so, so you will be my disciples. Let's pray together, could we? Father, we bless your holy word today. As I've already prayed, I'm so thankful that your word is like a window in which we can see you and see what you are about in our lives and in our world. Lord, your word is quick, it is sharp, it is powerful. And so, Father, I oftentimes pray that because we all need to be reminded that the Word of God is supernatural. And so, Father, as we preach the Word, as we read the Word, as we study the Word, you are able to accomplish things in our lives that mere consideration will not, will not cause it to take place. Lord, bless your people today. For it's in Jesus' living name I pray. Amen. Would you be seated, please? An old farmer frequently described his Christian experience by saying these words. Well, I'm not making much progress, but I'm established. <laughs> One spring when he was hauling some logs, his wagon wheels sank down deep into the mud, up to the axle. Try as he would, he couldn't get the wagon out Defeated, he sat on top of the logs, viewing the dismal situation that he found himself in. Soon a neighbor who had always felt uncomfortable with the farmer's worn-out testimony came along and greeted him. Well, Brother Jones, I see you're not making much progress, but you must be content because you are well established. I'm convinced that there are many today who you might be established in Christ, but you are not making much progress. You are the same place that you were six months, 12 months, 18 months, 36 months, five years ago. I don't believe that Jesus expects us to stay where we are. I think progress is part of what he's talking about here in John 15. Now let me remind you of the word, what the word abide means. The definition will appear once again on the screen. It says to remain, dwell, to live with. So when we abide in Christ, we remain with him, we dwell with him, we live with him. By the way, we don't live with him as an unwanted guest. We live with him as a family member. Isn't, that ought to put a smile on your face. It ought to. To stay in a given place, state, relation, or expectancy. Let me ask you the same question I asked last week. What are you expecting God to do in your life this morning? What do you expect him to do in your life this week? Do you have an expectation? 
I'm afraid too often times we have limited or no expectations of what we want God to do. We're just going through the motions. It's a state or a condition of the relation in which one person or thing stands with another. The picture there is Jesus Christ standing right there alongside you with whatever you are going through. Is that good news to you today? It certainly should be. So let's break down the process of real world vineyard care today. In the ancient Vita culture, practices also provide important background information. Now this, some of this will be historical information that I found very interesting in my study. So if you'll stay with me just for a few moments, we'll get to the meat of the message. There were two processes involved in growing vines, the vines and the branches. The first process was the training of the vine. Now, vines were trained in one of two ways. They were allowed to trail along the ground, and then the fruit-bearing branches were lifted up by placing rocks or poles up under them to allow aeration in order to ensure better grapes. Or, they were trained from the outset, from the very beginning as the vines began to grow. onto poles or trellises, and we've all seen that probably with grapevines. The branches were lifted up onto these poles or trellises to improve their fruit-bearing potential. The training, listen carefully, was preparation for the fruit bearing which was to come in the future. Now notice that. The training occurred before was born. Do you understand? You may look at your life and say, I, I don't see much fruit in my life right now. Could it be you're in that period of training? God is training you in his vineyard of this world. Now, there are three principles, and they'll appear on the screen one by one. There are three principles to understand, and I want you to listen to them very carefully. Principle number one is this. Without abiding, there will be no harvest of fruit. A branch that is not attached to to the vine will not bear fruit. Of the life from the vine to the branch, there will be no fruit that is born. Does that make sense to everybody? And there are things that can get in there. We'll talk about that next week. If I'm not careful, I'll jump ahead in next week's message. Without abiding, there will be no harvest of fruit. Now, listen, if there's no harvest of fruit, you ought to examine the abiding going on in your life. Principle number: Do not plant and immediately have a fruit-bearing harvest. It's not like someone is saved and instantaneously their life bears fruit, boom, like that. It takes a while for the harvest to come about. In order to have a harvest, there must be three things, and I'll just mention this quickly to you. One is time. There must be time involved for a harvest to come forth. It doesn't happen instantaneously. Now many folks today, because we live in such an instantaneous world, such a micro, seemingly microwavable world, we want to pray this prayer and we want God to act now. We want to read our Bible and all of a sudden become evangelists like Billy Graham. It takes time, time for fruit to be born. Does that make sense to everyone? It takes time, but it also takes training. Training. There are a whole lot of folks in the in the Christian world today who have never been properly trained. It's all we can do to get them to come to Bible study. It's all the church can do to get them to come to connect groups or Sunday school. We'll find a million reasons to set out. 
Well, I was in the hallway having coffee, or I had a conversation, or, or I can't come, or I've got this, or I've got that, or I can't get up early on Sunday morning. I know I went meddling there, okay? Just hold on. You understand? Everybody in this room wants to bear the fruit that God has us to bear. Amen? Amen. But we don't want to be trained to do it. We want to sit. It's like that old thing preachers always said. We want to sit, we want to soak, and we want to sour. You know what I'm talking about. Sit, soak, and sour. And lots of times that's done in a pew. Now, I'm glad you're here. Don't get me wrong. And, and there are a lot of other folks who should be here, and they're afraid, and the COVID variant, and all this other stuff. I, I'm, a, I'm aware of that. That's not to the point here. Training. Thank you for being here today. But there's also testing that takes place. Ask yourself, am I bearing fruit? Principle number three is this. Pruning, this, watch this, pruning is not punishment, but purposeful. Many times when God comes to our lives and he begins to prune back things, cut things out, remove things from our lives, we take it as, well, God's punishing me. No, it's very purposeful. Very purposeful. God's working in your life in a purposeful way. It's not punishing you. Pruning was an essential part of the first century viticultural practice as it is today. Now watch this. Here's a little more historical background. Pruning in this text involved two distinct seasons. Did you know pruning comes in different seasons? Season number one, the first pruning occurred in the spring when vines were in their flowering stage. The fact is this, spring pruning did not involve, listen, did not involve the removal of the wooden branches or their subsequent burning. In the spring, you weren't cutting out the dead wood. You were pruning the flowering branches. But season number two then, pruning occurred in the autumn after the grapes were harvested and the vines were dormant. This involved the removal of unwanted branches. Those that had produced fruit in the previous season, but not produced fruit in the ensuing season. In other words, they were finished. Does that sound familiar? I've done my part. Listen, there's not a single person, listen to me church. There's not a single person in this room or within the sound of my voice that cannot continue to produce fruit. God's not through with you yet. When he's through with you, you'll be gone. Not one minute, not one second before. It involved cutting back the desire branches, that is the shoots from the year old branches that would produce fruit in the coming year to, to ensure maximum fruit production. Now, there are three purposes of pruning. I want you to listen to these carefully. Because some of you, when pruning comes to your life as a believer, you've abided, you've done your best, you're trying to serve God as best you can, and pruning comes and you're going, God, what did I do? It's not punishment, it's purposeful. Some of you are asking God right now, God, why, why are you doing this? Why is this happening in my life? Why, 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 why? And you understand, aren't we glad God's big enough for us to ask why? He's okay with you asking why. But I would, I would encourage you to ask respectfully. Three purposes of pruning. Purpose number one is this. God prunes us in order to guide and guard growth. The pruning guides the growth. It guards the growth. 
the removal of the growing tips of vigorous shoots so that they would not grow too rapidly. If something, if, if the, the vine gets to growing too quickly, it's not healthy for it. It impacts the fruit on the other side. So pruning is in order to guide and to guard growth. Purpose number two. It's pruning in order to protect from harm. There are some situations in people's lives that God prunes out because you cannot see the harm or the danger that the enemy has wanted to bring to you in that situation. And he cuts it out. And you think, how in the world and why in the world? But you understand, we're not God and we don't see what he is doing. Pruning in order to protect from harm. Cutting off one or two feet from the end of growing shoots to prevent the entire shoot from being snapped off by the wind. That's real world stuff there. You've extended yourself further than God's ready for you to be. And so when the storms of life come, and make no mistake about it, the storms of life will come to us all. God prunes to protect us from harm. And thirdly and lastly is this. There's pruning in order to produce more and better fruit. I know some folks, and probably you do too, who want to be in the middle of everything. I mean, they've they got 25 plates spinning. And they're running here, keeping this one going. And then they're running here, keep this one going. Running here. They're just wearing themselves out. And not doing any of it very well. You understand, God has a way pruning that out, pruning this out, pruning that out. That you might do what you do for him to your very best. Is God talking to you this morning? I pray that he is. Pruning in order to produce more and better fruit. It's the removal of some flower or grape clusters so that those left can produce more and better quality fruit. Before I go to this last section, let me mention this to you. You know, there are a lot of people today who, who have equated busyness as productivity in God's kingdom. I'm so busy. I'm so busy. Let me just say to you, busyness does not equal productivity. You can be very active and very busy and have no time to yourself and no time really to spend any time with God and not be producing one thing for the kingdom of God. I jokingly tell folks all the time, you know, there's a difference between church work and the work of the church. And I'm afraid a lot of times congregations are busy with church work which is not always the work of the church. You understand the difference? Some of y'all are looking at me like, what? I understand that. First time I heard somebody say that statement, I said, what? Explain that to me. Church work. Work of the church. I'm telling you, church work is busy work. Produces nothing of eternal consequence. The work of the church is something that's empowered by God himself. Three final questions I'll leave you with today. 
Three questions. Question number one. Are you a branch abiding in the vine? Well, I hope so, Pastor. No, 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 no. Wrong answer. It's not I hope so. Either you are or you are not. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. There is no middle ground. There is no, there is no other plan to get you there. Either you're a branch or you're not. So do you know the, do you know the, the definitive answer to the question, are you a branch abiding in the vine? Now, there's several pieces in that question there. Are you a branch? <laughs> Are you abiding in the vine? Because as we're going to see next week, there are branches that are not abiding. But they are a branch. At one point, they were a branch. But they're no longer abiding. They're dry. They're dead. They're about to be cut off and piled up and burned like that tree, the branches that fell in my backyard. Now, if I went out there today and struck a match, I wouldn't have put gasoline on it. I just struck a match and threw it in there. It'd go, <laughs> it'd be gone just that quick. The fire department would be there immediately. My neighbor, neighbor I'd probably get a letter from the homeowners association about burning stuff in my backyard. Some of y'all are grinning because some of you got that same letter. I understand. Probably against county code or something, you know. You get the idea there. Are you a branch abiding in the vine? Either you are or you're not. Question number two is this. Have you been properly training to be part of God's vineyard? If you are not, listen to me, and I, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. But if you are not a part of a connect group, you should be in one. You should be in the study and under the study of God's word every single week. You should be in training. You should have, and this is a whole other series of messages, but you should have a daily quiet time. You should read your Bible every day. You mean, preacher, are you kidding me? Read my Bible every day and come to Sunday school or a connect group too? Who do you think I am? I think you're a branch. And branches don't say, well, I'm going to abide today and I'm not tomorrow. I'm abiding. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He also says, without me you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. You understand, some of us only want to abide when we need Him. But what you haven't figured out is you need Him every day. All day long. Every day. Now I'm telling you, I cannot get away from that image of that scotch taped rose bush. I'm telling you, I... There may be some here today, you scotch taped your life up to the vine thinking that's going to get you there. There is no life in the scotch tape, as fine a product as that is. What are you doing to properly train yourself to be part of God's vineyard? And thirdly and last, the last question is this. Are you producing fruit? Because you see, if you're a branch abiding in the vine, and if you've been properly trained then you are going to be producing fruit of eternal significance. And if you're not producing fruit, why not? Because Jesus is pretty definitive here in this passage when he says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will produce fruit. You will produce fruit. You understand, we wiggle and we complain and we try to avoid 
being pruned by God, but I want you to know it's one of the best things God does in any of our lives. Would you stand to your feet with heads bowed and eyes closed, please? Are you a branch abiding in the vine? Have you been properly trained to be part of God's vineyard? And are you producing fruit today? If not, why not? There is a huge menu I could give you with heads bowed and eyes closed. There's a huge menu I could give you about coming down this aisle, kneeling here at the front, taking me by the hand, letting me pray with you, letting others pray with you. I'm not going to give you a big menu because, listen, if God has spoken to your heart this morning and you know you need to be down here praying or you need to be down here making a decision, then you need to come on. And you need to come on right now. You don't need to even wait till I finish praying. But if God spoke in your heart, He didn't speak to you for you to consider it. He spoke to you to obey Him. Father, this invitation is issued in your name. Not in the name of of Sunrise Baptist Church or their pastor. But it is issued in your name, on your behalf. So, Father, I pray if there's those here this morning that you have spoken specifically and deliberately to about a decision they need to make, we pray that they will have the courage to say yes to you and no to themselves. I pray, Father, in this moment that you will draw men and women, boys and girls, to this altar for decision and for prayer. Father, we issue this invitation on your behalf. So you draw them now, Father. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. You come as the Lord leads you, please.
everything for me. I will follow you. This world has nothing. 